Well, welcome. Thank you for joining me uh, in this episode four in our series of reading the Bible as it was meant to be read. And this time we're going to undertake the reading of a complete work. We've done bits and pieces. Now we're going to do a complete work. Uh, you'll see that, uh, that it can be a daunting task for a very large volume. We're not going to do anything too large in this episode. In fact, even then we may not get it done. So let's go. Welcome to the Bible Journeys podcast. Your traveling companion is Ed Dickerson, an author, teacher, and scholar. He holds a master's degree in religious education from Andrews University. As you explore together, you'll learn tools and techniques that illuminate scripture, renew your faith, and brighten your journey. So here we are, read the Bible as it was meant to be read and reading a complete work. Now, whatever it is, the Bible has many forms of literature in it, and uh, they all need to be approached on the way they were intended to be read. No matter what type of literature uh, is in the Bible, and there are many types. There are narratives, we said, there's 75 to 80 percent of it. There's poetry. There are uh, epistles, letters, there are there's it's theology, there are many different types of literature, predominantly narrative. And to in this lesson, we're going to undertake something which is not primarily narrative exactly, but you'll see as we go along. Nevertheless, one of the ways to understand any complete work of the Bible, any book of the Bible, is to pretend that you got a letter in the mail. Now, I understand there are, there are epistles in the Bible. They're in the New Testament mainly. But uh, I'm, I'm going to look at everything as an epistle because when you get, at least when I get mail, I go there and the first thing I want to know is when I see a letter, who wrote it? Uh, was it written to me by someone I know, someone I care about? Was it, did it come from the IRS? That gets a different kind of attention. Is it just an advertisement? I can tell by the return address. Who wrote it? That's the first part. So we want to ask that question. Now, understand that most of the books of the Bible do not have an author attributed. And so if we're going to understand who wrote it, we have to do that from reading the text itself. Nevertheless, we want to be looking for evidence to see who might have written it, because uh, if it's written by my wife, for example, it would have one, one context. If it was written by one of my children, it would have a different context. If it was written by my boss. Might have to think about that. And uh, sometimes it's written by somebody you don't know at all or somebody you haven't seen for a long time. So that is, is a help to understand what this is about. It, it, you, depending on who wrote it and when they wrote it, which is the other part of the return address, or from where they wrote it, rather, uh, we also will look at when they wrote it. So who was it written for? Was it written to or for me, for example? Well, now, none of the Bible is written directly to me. It was written for me, for all of us, but it was written to others at a given time. And, and I don't know about you, but I get a lot of mail to my uh, address that's addressed to occupant. Uh, I don't know who he is, but he gets a lot of mail. And most of it uh, is not of any interest to me whatsoever. But there you are. And it can be uh, to retirees or Medicare recipients or whatever it is you want to know who was written to or for. Now, if it's written to you personally, that's one thing. Uh, I don't open my wife's mail unless she specifically wants me to. It's just a small matter of everyone needs their space. But the point is, it was written to one of us by name. It makes a little bit of a difference. It was written by hand. Of course, that makes a difference, too. We won't have that. That issue won't come up in Scripture. So, but imagine, again, when, you, when you're approaching a book of the Bible, you want to know who wrote it. Well, who was it written to or who was it written for? Uh, when was it written? You have some idea because part of the uh, process of interpretation is what we call biblical theology, which is understanding what they believed. And as we see in Scripture, the people who believed in God, their understanding of God, of theology, changed over time, just as ours does, doesn't it? And so, if that's the case, then we need to know where they were. What did they understand at the time? Because there were things that were not known. In the Old Testament, 
They looked forward, depending on where they were, they may have looked forward to Messiah, but what were they anticipating? And they did not know about Jesus. And so there are all of these things that need to be considered. There's a couple more. We mentioned them already. Where was it written? Where was it sent from? For example, supposing you discovered in your attic a letter from your great-great-great-grandfather who was in the Civil War, for example, and he wrote it to your great-great-great-great-grandmother uh, who was somewhere else, and you see that there's a distance between them and the time of the Civil War, and it makes a big difference. Or maybe it was just your grandparent in World War II, and they wrote home. All of these things can make a difference in how you view and understand the message because they made a difference to the people who were writing and receiving these things originally. So that's important. Who was it written? Who wrote it? Who was it written to? Who was it written for? When was it written? And of course, we have postmarks, but we, and when you come to ancient documents, it gets very difficult, but we often have a date range. And that can be very, very helpful. So knowing all of these things helps us to understand the mindset that sent it and the mindset that received it. And because that is what John Walton calls the face value reading of a text, which is how did the author, what did the author think he was saying? And what did he expect his audience to hear, to receive? because that is the message God wanted to get across through his prophet to his people at that time. And when we understand that message, and only when we understand that message, can we truly understand what it means for us today. And so again, it's part of reading the the Bible as it was meant to be read, reading the book as the author inspired by the Holy Spirit, but very definitely active, as we've already seen, we'll see more of, that the author, the human author was very much involved in this process, and that how they expected this to be received and understood by their audience, and likely how their audience did, in fact, understand it. So this is what we do, whatever book it is. And uh, something I don't have here, but something which I like to do personally, is I like to uh, focus in, after I think I have a general understanding of a book, and I like to summarize it in as, uh, very, very succinctly, a word, two words, maybe a couple of sentences at most. You know, think of the uh, typical 25 words or less they talk about for contests. And so, um, for example, uh, the book Hebrews, uh, it's, it, there's one word that sums up Hebrews, better. There's a better priest and a better temple with a better sacrifice. Everything in Hebrews shows how Jesus and his sacrifice and his time on earth was better than the Old Testament system. It was the fulfillment of it, but it was also better than. So better, if you read Hebrews, you think, ah, this is all about better. It helps to understand that book. It gives you a guidance. Same thing is true of any book of the Bible. If we can, if we can boil it down to a small description, then we have a general idea. It is not going to give us all the details, but it will give us the direction we're headed. And uh, the, someone said, you know, we steer by the stars, not because we hope to reach them, but because they tell us which way to go. Well, we steer by this summary, not because uh, we think it encompasses everything that's possible, but because it gives us a general uh, trajectory of the book. All right, and then why he's, what, did he, what did he write and why did he write it? And these things, again, must be derived from the text, but much of it will have to be derived from the text in many cases, most cases. So we're going to start with something that we can at least approach, because this can be a daunting. If you're talking about Isaiah, it's 66 chapters, um, and there are several main divisions in Isaiah. So... Uh, you know, it's not that simple. You, you have to, it takes a good long while to get the answers to these questions. And it's worth it, don't misunderstand me. But if you're just starting out, when you're beginning this process, it's very daunting to do that. It's only after you experience success in doing this in smaller passages that you begin to appreciate and, and uh, 
actually, I get excited about the prospects of studying something longer and larger. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read Philemon. This is not a book that uh, probably you've spent a lot of time on. It's a very short book, only 25 verses in the English translation. We're going to read Philemon as it was meant to be read. No, it's not a history book. It's not a narrative, although there is narrative within it. But it's just something that we can begin to comprehend in a couple of these podcasts. We can get a good handle on this book and its face value. Meaning, Philemon is an epistle, which simply means a letter. Uh, and to uh, get an idea from the Greek, an epistle is a message that is sent, a letter that is sent. An apostle is someone who is sent with a message. So you can see the similarity in the words there. An epistle. So it's a letter. And that works very well with my little paradigm of you received mail and looking at the return address and so forth. But that still is applicable even to works which are not letters because it has the same characteristics. It's written from someone to someone and so forth. Now, we mentioned this already. Most of the Bible is story. 75 to 80 percent of the Bible is narrative. It is not epistles. But and there are but there are quite a few of them in the New Testament. Um, so most of the Bible is story. But much of the New Testament, if you just numerically count the books, not the words, because you have uh, in the Gospels and Revelation, you have uh, many, many words comparatively. Some of the epistles are very short, just as some of our letters are very short. And at some point, we'll get to the fact that many of these letters are what are called occasional writings. Uh, we do this all the time. We just don't call it that. If you send a birthday card and a message, that's an occasional writing. If you send a get well card, that's an, that's an occasional writing. Something occasioned it, an illness, a birthday, an anniversary, a marriage, a death. You may send a sympathy card. All of the graduation present, all of these things are occasions, and they are occasions which cause us to write in many cases. So occasional writings, many of the epistles are in fact occasional writings. They are answers to questions or problems in one of the churches. And in some ways, Philemon is an, is an occasional writing, although not most like most of the others. But most of the New Testament is letters, if you look at it numerically. And letters, of course, can contain narrative. Here's what we did last week. It contain uh, narrative, perspective narratives of the future. Here's what we're going to do when we come to visit you. Um, here's my plans for college or whatever it is. Uh, it can be a narrative of, of one sort or another. There can be poetry. We often share things that matter to us, and especially love letters tend to have things like poetry in them, you know, lyrics to songs and so forth. And uh, so we find that also in, in the New Testament epistles. And, of course, there can be theology. We find that especially in Hebrews, which I already mentioned, and in the book of Romans. But there's theology sprinkled throughout many of the books. It's just that it's not they're not pure theology or not primarily theology. And that is true of Philemon. It's not primarily theology. It's certainly not poetry. There is a minimal narrative. It's only 25 verses, so there's not room for much narrative. But it has its own function. We're going to look at that. And Philemon has one really great virtue. It's short. And when we start out, you want to start out with things that are short and easy. You get better and you get to the point where you can do these things much more rapidly. But that doesn't happen at first. It's like if you learn to drive a car with a manual transmission, you know, you have to put in the clutch and press on the brake and then you shift and, and you let off the brake and you let, you let out the clutch and then get some speed, you know, press the accelerator and so forth. And when you first do that, it's like, oh, man, this is so complicated. And it takes, you know, uh, all of your concentration just to get to start smoothly. And there are many things like that, that when you first, the first time you do it, it just, it's just very complicated. The same first time you make a chord on your guitar, for example, there are lots of things like that. The first time you're, you're just figuring out how to do it. And, but as time goes on, if you get uh, adept at driving manual transmission, you don't even think about it. You just do it. And so the, the same thing can happen 
very much with uh, Bible study and learning to read the, the Bible as meant to be read. And that is over time, these things become automatic and become habits of mind. And you automatically do these things. You start reading a text. You don't say to yourself who wrote it, but you're looking for that. That's the first thing you go looking for. Now, the same is true, again, in many activities. And so that's what we're going to be doing here. We're going to get started with something nice and easy. It's like driving that manual shift around the block, not through traffic, where it gets to be very demanding, but around the block, uh, or maybe just around a parking lot. You know, that's the way you learn these things. Do something small and short and easy to get the techniques and the, and the uh, uh, basic tools under your belt. And once you do that, then you can do more ambitious things. So that's where we're going to start right here. And a letter of Philemon, especially, but many of the New Testament letters, uh, the letters in the Greco-Roman world of the first century, make some of this extremely easy for us because uh, we, for example, might put the return address at the top and say, dear so-and-so. But uh, the first century, they always start out with who was writing it and who they were writing to. That really makes our job a lot easier. Another good reason to start with an epistle. I, uh, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace and to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we are. This is the opening three verses of the uh, epistle to Philemon. And the first question is, who wrote it? Well, we see there, highlighted in blue. Uh, or that's obviously not for those on radio, but Paul, a prisoner, and Timothy. Those are the ones who wrote it. Notice that Paul's a prisoner. So this gives us a strong indication of where it came from as well. And so we can go to our uh, envelope and, and fill in uh, who, who wrote it. Paul and Timothy. That's who it's from. And uh, they're in a prison in Rome. Paul's in prison. Uh, it was possible in those days for prisoners to have uh, people who would visit them pretty much on a daily basis. They weren't uh, locked up with them, I don't think, but they were able to come repeatedly and, and to wait and to, to care for the, some of their needs. Because prisons were very um, minimal, we'll say, in those days. So there we have the beginning. Who wrote it and where was it written? Paul and Timothy from a prison in Rome. All right. To Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and Aphius, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. Now, interestingly, Archippus means master of horse. This would be the guy who was in charge of the stables. It could be a, po a, pro a proper name that someone was just named Archippus. Um, like we named someone Taylor, for example. And, of course, a tailor is also a trade, you know, person who sews and so forth. Well, Archippus, it could just be a name, but it could, it could be that he actually was the master of horse, the one who looked after the horses in Philemon, Philemon, sorry, Philemon's uh, household, because he has a household and he owns slaves. Philemon is not poor. He's well-to-do, and he might well have had a number of horses and stables, and Archippus, might, that might be his name, but it might be he's the one who takes care of the horses in Philemon's household. So he would be a person of some importance. And to the church in your house. And again, when we talk about houses in the uh, New Testament, we, our idea of a house church is somebody in a bungalow or a two-story home in a suburb or something like that, maybe even an apartment. Uh, the Roman household usually, when we, especially when you see somebody like uh, uh, Philemon, who has, uh, has a number of people in his house, so he has slaves and so forth, or Priscilla and Aquila, and many of these people were well-to-do, and they would have what we would probably call a villa. It would be an enclosed compound with several buildings and dwellings, and people would, they, the servants would live there, the slaves, would, though they're not necessarily the same people, uh, and they would have uh, lodgings for their friends, and their friends were not just simply acquaintances like we think. Their friends would be 
people like the accountant and the lawyer and so forth, the friends uh, in the New Testament era of someone who was a householder were their uh, business confidants. They were their people who knew their intimate details and so forth. So a house church in the first century was quite a few people very, very often. So we have who wrote it, and now we know how it was written to. Philemon, Aphia, and Archippus. All right. That's who it was written to or for. So we can fill that in in our little diagram. It was written by Paul and Timothy and from a prison in Rome and is written to Philemon, Aphia, and Archippus. And we know it was written about AD 57 to AD 65. That's the time that uh, Paul was in prison. He was martyred in 65, I believe. So it is, we know that it's roughly 30 to 40 years after the crucifixion, somewhere in that time period. So we know it was fairly, fairly close. And again, and for ancient dates, that's pretty good. That's not bad to be within that time range. So this is the salutation. We just read that. Paul, prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, and so forth. And then he says, grace to you and peace from our God, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the salutation. That's the first part. So we can fill in most of this. Here he says, I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for the sake of Christ. For I have great joy, I have had great joy in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. And look at what this means. This is the affirmation. He's affirming that Titus is a, a beloved person and is a stalwart in the faith, and he wants to make this clear that he understands this and appreciates it. Therefore, though I have confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for the love's sake, I, I sake I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. That's the appeal. And most of this letter is going to be an appeal that is made from Paul to Philemon. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom you affirmed in my imprisonment, who previously was useless to you, but now is useful to both you and to me. I have sent him back to you, in person that is, sending my very heart, whom I wanted to keep with me, so that in your behalf he might be at my service in my imprisonment for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. Perhaps, for perhaps it was for this reason that he, that is Onesimus, your slave, was separated from you for a while that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you regard me as a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, have written this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe to me even yourself, own self as well. Yes, brother, let me be benefit. Let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you will do even more than what I say. 
at the same time also, prepare me a guest room, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you as do Mark, Aristarchus, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. There it is. We did this one quick reading through, and we do this as the way to approach it with a, a what uh, Morton Rander called a pre-reading. We just go through it and get the feel for the whole thing. Clearly, this is an occasional writing. It was occasioned by the fact that Onesimus, who was a slave, had apparently run away from Philemon. And Paul now is returning Philemon with this message. It's a very interesting thing when you think about it. And that's the whole point. We're not going to be able to do it anymore in this session, but I want you to look at it, and in the next podcast, we'll get down to how do we understand this, see all the details. There's a lot of things going on in here that are under the surface, and how does this matter to us today in our own Christian walk? And just as a, a hint, I'm going to point out that, you know, many people say the Bible approves of slavery. Does it look to you like the Bible approves of slavery here because he says, I'm sending him back to you as a slave? What do you derive from this? Where do you, what do you, what do you get from this? I'd like to look at that in more detail. And let's see if we can maybe complete this in the next podcast. Well, I hope you'll join me then. And I hope that you find your own treasures as you embark on your own Bible journeys. If you've gained something from this discussion, please be sure to share it with someone, because those who join our Bible journeys here can become our traveling companions for eternity. <music>